Patrick, can you hear me? Very well. Mm -hmm. So the title of the paper is uh, Bond Funds and Credit Risk, uh, also co-authored by Amil Dasgupta at LSC and Jimmy O oh at Hanyang University, who I believe are also uh, in, the, in the Zoom uh, and will help me with ask, answering questions from time to time. Okay, so here's a little bit of background <clears throat> of the market right now. So on the left, we have uh, a pizza chart of um, corporate bond holdings in 1998. And on the right, we have uh, the same chart for two, uh, 2017. Okay. So one big change over this period of time is the growth of the open and mutual funds holding uh, corporate bonds. So back in 1998, corporate bond funds were only a smaller portion of the market. But by 2017, and it should be bigger by now, it is our second largest investor group uh, for corporate bonds in the US, almost as large as the insurance company, which is the largest. So given this backdrop, so we want to examine uh, and examine how this growth of the investor base is gonna affect the credit risk of the underlying firms. So in our view, the increased presence of open and mutual funds presents a fundamental change in the capital supply in the corporate bond markets. And here are the main reasons that why we think so. So first of all, in comparison with other investors, bond mutual funds face greater risk of investor redemptions or flows. And also funds really care about the investor flows because obviously their incentives are aligned with having more flows and larger assets under management. And what is also known in the, in the mutual fund market is that investor flows respond positively to fund performance. So when funds are showing higher performance, they're getting more money. When their performance is not good, they're suffering outflows. So given this backdrop, uh, this is the story that we want to deliver in this paper. So the presence of these flow motivated mutual funds at refinancing points of firms, that is going to interact with the strategic default incentives of the equity holders. And we will argue that this interaction effect is going to increase the credit risk of underlying firms. So this is what we do in our paper. So we will examine how the flow concerns. Oh, so this, I skipped one slide, so let me take a step back. So this is the uh, underlying economic mechanism that we have regarding the interaction between the flow motivations and our strategic default incentives of equity holders. So suppose a firm with a low cash flow prospects, uh, which are uh, uh, wanting to refinance is maturing debt. So what's going on? So you know, when the firm defaults, say the funds, mutual funds, participating in rolling over the existing debt might, might face future penalties in the form of outflows if the firm doesn't go very well. And the reason is that uh, future default is going to be costly for all the investors, but it's going to be particularly more costly for mutual funds because they're going to suffer additional outflows. Knowing this possibility of future outflows, funds will be more risk averse. They'll be more reluctant to roll over the expiring debt and demanding lower refinancing prices for the new bonds. Now on the part of the equity holders, now the, the mutual funds are demanding lower prices. That is gonna increase the strategic default incentives of the equity holders because for the shortfall of the, uh, of the rolling over should be uh, taken care of by the equity holders by infusing more, uh, more cash into the firm. 
So that creates stronger incentives for equity holders to strategically default. So the, this presence of flow-motivated mutual funds at refinancing is going to translate into the higher credit risk of the firms that these mutual funds actually hold. Okay. So this is what we do in our paper. So we will examine overall how the flow concerns of the capital suppliers or the mutual funds is going to affect the credit risk. And we will first show the th theoretical framework to illustrate the link between the fund's presence at refinancing and the equity holders default incentives. And we will show a asymmetric effect. In other words, because of the flow concerns, mutual funds will be more uh, risk averse. They will demand discount for bad cash flow firms, but they are also willing to pay more for good cash flow firms, but only when the cash flow prospects are bad, that is going to interact with the strategic default incentives of the firm. So only for poor cash flow firms, the effect of the mutual funds is going to increase the credit risk. Then we will move on to the empirical part and show that fund holdings actually increase the credit risk, particularly for high risk firms or low cash flow prospects firms and also firms that are mainly held by high flow risk funds. Therefore, we, we confirm the theoretical predictions of the framework. And also we will focus on addressing the endogeneity concerns uh, inherent in the relationship between fund holdings and the prices or credit risk we use two related and distinct approaches. In the first approach, we will use an IV, an instrumental variable, that exploits the cross-sectional predetermined variation in the propensity of funds to hold underlying bonds. And in the next one, we will use a more time series shock-based quasi-experiment, and then using a diff and diff setting, we will show that uh, we will show evidence consistent with the causal link from the fund holdings and the underlying credit risk. So let me first give you the, um, the big picture of the model setting. It's a very cute, nice model. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details, only give you the main intuition. So we provide a very simple model to illustrate the strategic default incentives similar to Leland and Default or He and Xiong 20, uh, 2012. So it's a two period model. There's a terminal cash flow at the final period and the firm has a debt maturing in the middle. Okay? So the terminal cash flow is at time two, but the firm has a bond maturing at time one. So the firm has to roll over this expiring debt. And then there's a probability public prior on the successful cash flow, which is gamma B. Now, because the firm has an expiring bond, it has, it has to issue another discount bond uh, at time one to roll over uh, the cash flow into the next period. Now, the rollover price of the bond is gonna be P because the face value is one, whatever the shortfall, which is one minus P, should be taken care of by the equity holders. In other words, the, the shortfall should be paid by the equity holders. That creates the strategic default incentives. So the equity holders, when the first bond is expiring, is going to, uh, is going to balance the benefit and the cost. And that is going to uh, give us the first prop proposition in the paper about the default, uh, strategic default threshold. So if the refinancing price offered uh, from the bondholders is too low, then the equity holders is going to choose to default strategically. Now, given this um, <clears throat> basic setup, we will introduce uh, bond funds in the model. So the, we will change the identity of the refinancers to bond mutual funds from uh, profit maximizing benchmark case. 
So how do we model flow motivated bond funds in the paper? So the refinancers or bond funds care about the opinion of the principals or the outside investors. So the outside investors observe two things, whether the fund actually invested or not or refinanced or not in time one, and also whether the bond defaults or not in the final period. Now the funds have two types. Uh, the funds can be either skilled or good types, or they can be bad or unskilled funds. And the outside investors, they will observe the two signals, I mean, two actions by the funds, whether the fund uh, participated in re refinancing or not, and also whether the uh, firm actually defaults or not. So using these two, uh, these two information, the outside investor is gonna form the posterior belief about the quality of the mutual fund manager. Now, given this setting, we will assume that funds payoff is composed of two parts. The first one is the, uh, ex the payoff from holding the bond. This is the fundamental part. And the second part is, uh, is the reputation for being informed about the firm. So the second part is basically the compensation based on the posterior belief of the outside investors about the mutual fund manager. So having observed uh, the fund's action and also whether the firm defaults or not, the outside investor is gonna form the posterior belief about the manager and based on the uh, posterior belief, the outside investor is going to properly compensate the mutual fund managers. Now, under this situation, uh, we obtain the following equilibrium prices for the uh, refinancing bonds. So the refinancing price of the bond has two components. The first component is the fundamental component or the expected cash flow from, the, from holding the bond. The second component is the flow premium or the discount. That is the, the, the price component that induces the mutual fund managers to participate in this refinancing game. And the key intuition in this setting is that when the gamma B falls, in other words, when the public belief of the success of cash flow is low or the firm has low cash flow prospects, the mutual fund is particularly less willing to participate in this game because if you participate in this game and roll over the expiring bonds, the, bond, the firm is very likely to default. So even if you participate, then the outside investors will probably penalize you. So mutual, fund, uh, mutual funds knowing this will, will demand more discount for such bonds. So when gamma V or gamma V is low or the public belief of the successful cash flow is low, then the refinance price is going to be particularly low. So this is the graphical illustration of why the default is going to be uh, more likely when uh, cash flow pros prospects is low, especially for mutual fund managers. So the, the light blue line here, light blue line is the benchmark case uh, when the investors are just profit maximizers. And this darker blue line darker blue curve is the mutual fund manager. So mutual fund managers, their willingness to pay for the refinancing is gonna be much lower than the benchmark case as the cash flow prospect is decreasing. And the reason is um, because these, these firms are more likely to default. If you participate in this game, it is likely that the outside investor is going to is still going to uh, judge you as a bad type. So, so to incentivize mutual fund managers to participate in this game, the equity holders should offer much lower prices. Then what's happening is that this red line is the strategic default boundary of the equity holders. So if the cash flow prospects are low, 
then the uh, default threshold is much higher. But when cash flow prospect is high, default threshold becomes lower. And this graph illustrates why the uh, with why the presence of mutual fund is going to increase the default threshold and therefore why firms are more likely to default in this case. So here are the uh, empirical predictions from the model. So the model predicts that, predicts that when the firm has poor cash flow prospects, the presence of mutual funds at refinancing is going to increase credit risk. And this effect is particularly strong when the funds who hold these bonds are more sensitive to flow consequences. Now empirically, we will use the holdings of firms' bonds uh, in normal time to proxy for, um, for, for the participation of the mutual funds at refinancing. So data, we will use the Morningstar holdings data from 2001 to two, uh, 2015. And the key explanatory variable is what we called active fund holding share or AFHS, which is simply the total holdings uh, by mutual funds in firm I divided by the total amount outstanding for the firm. And for the uh, for the dependent variable, we will use the CDS uh, spreads because CDS spreads are a cleaner measure of, uh, of credit risk. Okay. Now, the key issue in, in the empirical implementation is endogeneity because fund holdings and credit risk or credit prices are uh, jointly determined. So, for example, uh, some funds might want to hold uh, risk here or they want to take more risk uh, because of the reaching for yield incentives. So the question we want to answer is, can we find an instrument for fund holdings that tends to be orthogonal to credit risk? And we will use the idea, uh, we will use the investment variable, instrumental variable based on the idea of the hypothetical holdings of Koyen and Yogo 2019. So the key idea of this IV approach is that uh, a lot of funds investment universe is sticky because it's dictated by predetermined investment mandates or, um, or the investor and issue relationship, underwriter relationship. Now we will exploit this cross-section variation in, in funds investment universe and also funds assets under management. Okay. So for example, if a bond is held by, a, if, if a bond is included in the investment universe of a lot of funds or large funds, large funds, then the propensity to hold these bonds or the hypothetical demand for these bond is going to be stronger. And that is the main cross-sectional uh, variation that our IV is going to exploit. So more specifically, the hypothetical holdings are defined as equal weighting of all bonds in the investment universe of a fund. Okay. Now we proxy, we estimate the investment universe based on the funds holding in the past three years following Coin and Yogo. And then we construct the instrumental variable uh, which is calculated in the following way. So we will aggregate the hypothetical holdings, which is the equal weighting of all bonds in the investment universe, using the assets under management, aggregate the uh, hypothetical holdings and divide by the total amounts outstanding. So that is our main instrument of variable Z. So what is the key exclusion restriction here? So the investment universe is mostly predetermined and also the distribution of fund assets under management is not affected by the credit risk of the individual firms or there is no other channel between the distribution of fund assets under management and the credit risk of the firms other than the channel of the refinancing and the strategic default incentives. 
So this is our uh, two-stage least square specification. So we will regress the CDS spreads on the fund holding share, which is instrumented by these hypothetical holdings. And our theory predicts that this coefficient beta on fund holding share is gonna be positive, particularly for funds with high risk and also funds, uh, also for bonds held by funds with stronger flow sensitivity. So this is the first uh, set of results. So we regress uh, the CDS spreads on the five-year contract on the active fund holding share. And we find strong positive relationship between the two. In other words, when funds, uh, when active fund holding share is higher, then the uh, CDS spreads of these firms will also be higher. And this effect is economically significant one standard increase, one standard deviation increase in active fund holding share corresponds to 22 basis point increase in CDS. And then we look at um, the effect on the on the on the firms with uh, bad cash flow prospects, right? That was the, which was the uh, prediction of our model. So we interact. Uh, fund holding share with the dummy variable indicating uh, lower credit rating. And we find that most of the unconditional effect that we that I showed in the previous slide is basically coming from uh, coming from uh, funds uh, firms with low cash uh, negative cash cash flow prospects, which also uh, confirms our theoretical prediction. Now we focus on the refinancing points because our theoretical framework is, is based on the refinancing channel. Okay. So intuitively, when uh, the proximity, proximity of, of active fund holding share to a refinancing event should, uh, should capture this effect, right? So when the firm is approaching its refinancing moment, our economic effect should be the strongest at that moment. So to capture this effect, we interact uh, active fund holding share with a dummy variable that represents bond maturity in the next month. And we ex expect this interaction effect should be positive according to our mechanism. And that is indeed what we find. So we are interacting here, the active fund holding share with the maturity dummy. And this uh, interaction term is positive and statistically significant, meaning that the effect of the bond fund presence is uh, almost doubles in the month prior to a bond maturity. Jay Wan, I'm just uh, notifying you, you have about three minutes left. Three minutes? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now we look at the effect of the flow concerns on credit risk. So we measure uh, flow concerns in four different ways. For example, when the fund has experienced poor recent returns, um, the flow concern is gonna be stronger because it is very well known in the bond fund literature that flow performance relationship is concave, meaning that funds with negative past returns will have greater sensitivity to uh, flow performance sensitivity. We also use flow volatility as a measure of flow concerns. And the third measure of flow concern is the size of the fund families. If the fund, is, if the fund belongs to a smaller family, then the liquidity backstop is going to be weaker. So there's going to be more flow concerns. And the last uh, proxy we use for flow concern is the proportion of the, the, the existence of the load fees, for example, backhand load fees or redemption fees, because with these fees, uh, it is more difficult to fund investors to uh, withdraw their money. So the, the flow is going to be more stable for such funds. Now we we're gonna examine whether the credit risk effect is stronger for funds with high flow concerns. And that is basically what we find. Across all the four uh, measures of flow concerns, we find that for funds with stronger uh, flow concerns, the effect of a bond fund presence on credit risk is much stronger. Okay. 
Now, in the last part, we look at this quasi-experiment and do definitive test. So this is the, the, the setting where uh, presumably there was a shock to flow concerns that is unrelated to firm fundamental. So what is the setting that we exploit? Uh, we exploit the, uh, the departure of Bill Gross from PIMCO in 2014, the new surprise to market, and there was a massive uh, investor uh, outflow from, um, flow from PIMCO, and therefore there was significant uncertainty about the PIMCO's investor base because of Bill Gross' departure. So we, will, so we will use the setting as a different diff uh, regressions. So we regress uh, CDS spreads over minus six to plus six horizon. So time zero is the departure of Bill Gross from PIMCO, uh, which is basically the setting of uh, Chipei Zhu's paper. And the treated firms are the ones that are held, uh, more than 5% of their bonds are held by PIMCO in August of 2015. 14, and we use two control groups. The first set of control group is basically all firms held by mutual funds. And the second set of control group is the, the second set of control firms is the, is the, is the firms held by Vanguard and Prudential, which are the second largest bond funds next to PIMCO. And this is the, uh, these are the results from the different different regressions. So we find that after uh, Bill Gross departure, the treaty firms have a much higher, a much greater increase in CDS spreads. Uh, and the effect is particularly concentrated on the uh, low quality firms or the firms with low cash flow prospects, as you can see from columns three and four. So to conclude, uh, the bond holdings of open and mutual funds exacerbates the credit risk of firms, particularly for firms with poor cash flow, cash flow prospects, and the relationship is stronger when fund holdings, uh, when funds are more flow concerned. So the overall conclusion of our paper is that the supply side effect um, factors affect corporate credit risk, and the regulators should be, should be more aware of the changes in the investor base because that can uh, affect the real outcomes for firms. And we show that no new sources of economic risk that can arise from the incentives of long-only asset managers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay Wan, for a fantastic presentation. So our first discussion today is uh, Vikas Agarwal from um, Georgia State University. Vikas, uh, if you can start sharing your screen, the floor is yours and you have 15 minutes. I'll let you know when you're 12 minutes into you, the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all see my slides? Everything looks good. Very good. Thank you very much, Patrick and Christian, for inviting me to discuss this paper. Obviously, doing it on Zoom is not the same as having it with you know all this uh, discussion with a glass of wine in Montreal. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, um, I think you, you've given me enough incentives by asking me to, to uh, discuss this interesting paper, um, which I think Jayvon did a very good job of presenting. So, uh, uh, so it's my pleasure to, to, to share my thoughts on this. Um, let's hold on, why is this not working? Okay, so, um, so uh, I have limited time, so I'm just going to give a very quick sort of summary of what this paper is about. Um, so as, uh, so the main idea of the paper is sort of related to this uh, literature, which is looking at strategic complementarities uh, in funds, where if the fund is holding a very illiquid, uh, very illiquid assets, uh, but if you're a mutual open and mutual fund, then you have to provide uh, uh, liquidity to your investors on a daily basis. So uh, essentially the mutual fund is doing a job of uh, liquidity transformation uh, because their liabilities are very liquid, but their assets can be very illiquid. And when you think about illiquid assets, then you know, corporate bonds are right up there because these are uh, relatively illiquid. 
And so if uh, the fund manager is not doing well, what will happen is that investors will start withdrawing their capital and, um, and this will impose significant costs for the, for the fund managers because they have to liquidate and, 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 and return the money to the investors. And you know, this will potentially involve fire sales. And if you know that other people are going to withdraw, then you want to be first in the queue. So you kind of get into this run kind of situation, which, which has been sort of documented in the bank, uh, you know, uh, bank runs literature by Diamond and Dibbert. So, um, so the main idea in the paper is that uh, if these corporate bond funds, because of this type of investor fragility, uh, they will be reluctant to refinance firms that have a greater, greater chance of default. And uh, because of this uh, reluctance, what will happen is when these bonds will be reissued, uh, will be reissued by the firms, uh, they're going to get a lower bond price in the primary market. And this gives incentives for the equity holders to, uh, to engage in strategic default. And so the authors are basically postulating a positive relation between bond fund holdings in a firm and in the credit risk of the firm. So that's the that's, that's sort of the main um, idea of the paper. And very quickly to summarize the, the results, um, uh, as Jaywan showed, the firms with uh, poor cash flow pros prospects and active fund bond holdings will therefore be associated with higher credit risk. And for uh, credit risk, the authors are basically using CDS spreads as a proxy, and the, they show that the CDS spreads are, are high and they are especially uh, large when funds are more sensitive to flows, because that's the main story that the, 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 the things that drive uh, all of this is this investor fragility. So the authors recognize that is endogeneity concerns between the fund holdings and credit spreads. And so they use an IV and you know, they use this quasi experiment, quasi natural experiment uh, where Bill Gross, uh, one of you know the kings in in this uh, in the bond asset management uh, world uh, departed from Pimco and that had a shock, the flow shock, and how uh, what happens as a result of that to the credit risk. So the main idea, the underlying message of the paper is that essentially who holds a firm's bond matters for its credit risk. So we need to know the identity of the capital supplier, and that has implication for the credit risk. And uh, you know uh, this can have uh, real implica uh, real um, effects on the form, uh, although the paper doesn't really go into showing that. So my first uh, thought when I started reading the paper um, was, you know, how big are these bond mutual funds? And and this picture I basically got from ICI Factbook, the investment company institute Factbook. Um, and you see that there is a huge growth in the, in the flows to the bond mutual funds. These numbers that I have plotted here are in billions of dollars on a monthly basis. And, um, and what ICI reports is that over the last decade, uh, bond mutual funds held about 11% of the overall U.S. bond market. And this bond market includes government bonds, corporate bonds, and tax exempt bonds. Uh, and this is as the at, at at the end of last year, and it has gone up from about seven percent uh, about ten years back in two thousand nine. So um, why is this important? Well, it's important because if you are trying to basically make a case that the activities of bond funds can have implications for asset prices, then you effectively have to think about these funds uh, as uh, as being marginal investors in this market to some extent. And so, um, so I then compared these numbers with the figure one in the paper and they're the authors, like I think uh, J1 showed that nice pizza kind of picture without the pizza. Uh, uh, and basically, you know, they show that the, 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 the holding share has gone up from 8.4 to like 20% within only the corporate bonds. And so I didn't quite see how this sort of matches up with the ICI. And I was wondering why the numbers are so, so different. So it might be worthwhile to sort of dig into this and see 
uh, what's really going on here? Why is why their numbers are like a whole, whole lot higher? Um, so that was just my first observation. So let me give you first my overall view about the paper. So I think the idea is very interesting because um, it sort of links the supply side to un, uh, understand what how it can potentially affect the credit risk. And the main idea is that there's this rollover risk when the firm has to refinance. And uh, so it sort of contributes to this literature, which is much larger, which has so far only focused on the demand side. So people have looked at borrower related factors or they, they may look at aggregate market conditions and how that affects credit risk. So the paper is making a good contribution by looking at it from the supply side. So I have like five sort of categories of suggestions or comments that I'm going to go through. So, um, so the first point is about direct evidence. So let's go back and think about the story again. What's the story? The story is that when a firm with poor cash flow prospects is coming back to the market, they want to raise capital. Uh, they would not have these bond funds interested in, in, in participating in this market especially when these bond funds are facing a lot of uh, flow performance sensitivity. They have a lot of flow concerns. Um, but so, so when you want, when you read this, something like this, you want to like really see that you observe lower bond prices and less participation of corporate bond funds when there is a debt issuance. Um, and so I was looking for that evidence in the paper and, you know, Unfortunately, they don't have the data and they don't really provide that evidence. So what do they provide? They provide basically an empirical test, which is somewhat closely related to this. And what they do is they basically use this near maturity dummy. So I've just kind of uh, copied and pasted that table that Jeva showed. And they interact these fund holdings with the near maturity dummy. And they show that the effects are stronger when the firms have bonds which are maturing within the next three or six months, okay? So is this same as saying that there will be lower bond prices and less participation? Well, not quite because it's not really clear whether the firms that have imminent financing needs do actually refinance if only one of their bonds is, is maturing. So I think it would be nice if the authors can sort of make a more convincing case about why, you know, what, uh, whether this, you know, how, how good is this proxy that they are using? How, how, what's the correlation between this? And this is challenging. So I can see that this is not easy. Why? Because if you think about it, if refinancing costs are indeed very high for firms with greater credit risk, they would, they may not even refinance. And so you might think that, this action would then effectively be unobservable because they will not choose to refinance if, if they are really concerned about this. Okay, my second point is about endogeneity, but it's a little bit different from the, the point that uh, Jaywan made. The point that Jaywan made is the endogenous relation between fund holdings and credit risk. And uh, he has a very nice paper where he shows that you know uh, uh, funds reach out for yield and, and they may, invest in risky bonds. My concern was slightly different because I was thinking about the manager skill, which is essentially a, can be considered as a potentially omitted variable that can affect both the credit risk and as well as the fund holdings. And, and, and um, so let me, let me talk about like, what is the concern I have? The poorly performing funds, one could argue, may have lower security selection skills. So they, it's not like, um, it's not a random thing. They are more likely to pick firms with poor prospects. Okay, so, it, so the manager skill has, has a, it sort of plays into this relation between the fund holdings and credit risk. In the, so I read the prior version of the paper and then Jaywan sent me a new one where they used the Bill Gross uh, shock. In the earlier version, they had used merger shock. And merger shock was not good, I thought, because you know, poor performance are also more likely to be target for mergers. So it doesn't really address this concern that I had. So I was happy that, you know, they came up with something different this time around. I have a few things to say about that. I'll come to that if I have time. Also, the other thing is managers of poorly performing funds might take more risk. Uh, this is what we refer to as gambling for resurrection. So you could engage in a risk shifting behavior. And so that's another reason why 
you might see this behavior, which is somewhat different from the reaching for yield argument. Alternatively, you could think about, shouldn't the poor performing, poorly performing funds be less likely to hold le low credit quality firms in the first place if they are concerned about investor fragility? So you can also make the point in the other direction and say, hey, if you are poorly performing and you know that there is this you know, uh, risk that investors, so they should not be even investing in low credit quality firms to begin with. So where is the question of refinance? Because remember, in their model, the idea is that they are the bond the bond funds are already holding this this bond and now uh, bond of that firm and now going to participate in the reissuance uh, of the bond right so so i think this may be worthwhile thinking about and so this is the pimco shock so pimco shock is interesting but it's not truly exogenous so if you look at what happened this is a uh, a picture i took from one of the articles where the, i've given you the link here basically so shows that when uh, a lot was going on in pimco when bill gross was was uh, uh, had to leave and so the firm was uh, doing uh, pretty badly and so th this also uh, sort of goes and links with what i was just mentioning about skill and poor performance so it's not totally exogenous which sort of addresses the concern that that i mentioned because you have about 3 minutes left Okay. All right. I have three points in three minutes. Okay. So let me give you that. The, the next point is about investors' perception. So the idea of the authors is that investing in a riskier bond may either enhance or damage investors' posterior about the manager skill. But funds hold a diversified portfolio. So my, my thought was, how come investors would change their perceptions about the manager skill if only one bond suffers from default? And even if you assume that investors actually read the holdings disclosure, because there is a lot of debate about whether investors really look at the bond holdings very carefully. And if the story is really about investors assessment of manager skills, should we not observe the same results for passive funds? Because passive funds by, by definition don't have any skills. So it might be worthwhile to think about placebo tests to, to rule that out. My next point is about feedback effect. If poorly performing funds hold existing debt of a firm and choose not to refinance, right? So you're a bond fund, you hold the debt of the firm and you choose not to refinance. Now fund investors can view that, right? They can see that you chose not to participate. So that would be a confirmation that, bad, that funds made a bad choice in the first place and have now recognized it. So in this case, you may still bear the cost of investors withdrawing their capital. This will give you a totally opposite prediction where you have this feedback effect which is coming from investors learning from no, you're not participating in the reissuance, okay? So I have like probably 30 seconds. So let me say the last thing, no discussion is complete without citing your own paper. And so I'm going to do that job as well. You, so, you, have, a, you have a minute, so no, no stress. Okay, all right, good, thank you. So the last point is about liquidity management. Right, so this whole paper is sort of uh, banking on this idea that there is this investor fragility which comes from the illiquidity of the assets held by these bond funds. And so the authors show that large families and families which have these back end loads, they do not have as much impact on the credit risk because they don't have to worry about the outflows from the investors after poor performance. So, in a paper that I did with Haibe Zhao, uh, we used, uh, we showed that there is this interfund lending in large families uh, and the authors kindly cite our work and, and, and use that to uh, support the point that large families don't suffer from this. But in that paper, we also show there are other factors that also drive this interfund lending, like fund governance, restrictions on borrowing, investment in illiquid securities. So I was wondering why not use that or even better would be just to identify families with interfund lending and then show that your effects are weaker for those families which have interfund lending, okay? So that's one thing you could do. Other thing you could do is interfund lending is not the only game in the town. You can also use a lot of other liquidity management tools that can also help the funds to deal with this um, flow shocks. So you can look at cash holdings, you can look at credit line, redemption in mind where funds can give the bonds instead of the cash or you can use swing pricing so there are lots of other things that uh, the funds can play around with and so it might be worthwhile to to
to think about some more cross-sectional tests to show this. So it might, see, it might seem that I'm unhappy about the paper, I'm not. I think it's a good paper. I think I'm, all I'm asking the authors is to do is to sort of dig a little bit more to convince us this is what's really going on. It's very thought provoking, as I said, you know, because they are, they're, they're one of the first to show that the, you know, the supply side affects the credit risk. And I think that is a very important contribution. So, uh, and the paper is nice in terms of, you know, doing both theory and empirics, which is, which is, uh, you know, always good. And so I encourage everyone to read and I wish all the best to the authors that uh, enjoyed uh, reading it myself. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Vikas. So, uh, J1, for the, in the interest of the discussion, I would kind of invite you to perhaps pick one or two points to which you would like to kind of respond, but then uh, afterwards we can discuss offline and then leave the floor essentially to the other participants to, to ask questions. You are muted right now, J1. Can you just unmute yourself, please? I am muted, yes. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you, Vikas, for, uh, for great points. Uh, you gave me a lot of uh, food for thought that we can use to uh, help uh, further make our case. So let me talk about the endogeneity point, right? So, so you raised the point that uh, poorly performing funds, maybe they want to take more risk. They want to catch up with, uh, with the leading funds. So they might invest more in the, uh, in, the, in the bad quality firms or high credit risk firms. But that is particularly that the channel we want to rule out, right? So for that to happen, uh, for that to um, mess up with our instrumental variable. So we will expect that fund managers will choose to change the investment mandate or the investment universe. But what we find, and also what our Coin and Yogo document is that investment universe is very, very sticky. And so if you look at the past 36 months holdings of a fund, then, then the, it, the, the universe itself doesn't change very often. So it's not likely that the universe is going to be affected by funds incentive to catch up with the leading firms. The second channel, uh, second possible channel is that these are uh, poor performing funds, their assets under management tends to be lower. Right? But for what our IV is capturing is that when large funds have more of these bonds in their investment uh, universe, then the, the demand is going to be stronger. So it actually goes in the opposite direction. For your, your story to work, then these poor, poorly performing funds whose assets under management is low. So in our IV variable, that effect is going to be actually stronger. So it actually works against our, I mean, it, it goes in the opposite direction to our finding. So this uh, risk, excessive risk taking by poorly performing or low skill fund is not uh, what is going to affect our our endogeneity, uh, the IV channel, right? But your other point about the about the other the other one, we will think about it more. Okay. And um, you mentioned about the PIM codes. Uh, so Jay, Jay Ron, I'm just giving you the heads up to be to make it quick because we would like to leave a little bit of time for for questions also from the floor if there are any. Okay. Just uh, let let me just spend thirty minutes, uh, thirty seconds. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, so we so in the paper we look at the uh, the uh, parallel trend assumption of the PIMCO. And it's possible that there must have been some, there could have been something happening uh, in PIMCO before the departure, but at least uh, what we find from our data is that the parallel of uh, trend assumption is holding very well. So we, we couldn't find any um, substantial uh, trend before the, uh, before the bill was departure. So we, we do not believe that it's gonna affect our uh, definitive setting very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, J1. I think we can get back to this if we have time, but I would now like to kind of see whether there's any questions from the audience. 